how this moves. Ready? Is this just going to be here? It's also going to broadcast our room. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, thank you, Julie. She's like a plant in the back of the room. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. Happy second Monday. Welcome to the Institute on the Environment. My name is Jessica Hellman, and I get the privilege of welcoming you all here uh, before we have the opportunity to introduce our spectacular panel. So you are at something called Second Mondays. Second Mondays are an invention. This is our second semester of them here at the Institute on the Environment. They are places where we want to take a deep dive into a topic of importance. We say here the Institute on the Environment is about helping to build a future where people and planet prosper together. So at Second Mondays, we want to talk about what are those topics that are really essential for that prosperous, environmentally sustainable, equitable, and just future to be true. And so today is just one of those topics. Today we are going to talk about environmental justice, and we're uh, greatly privileged to have uh, a panel of excellent speakers here today. So we're looking at big questions, really focused on collaboration, and how we move forward on these sti sticky uh, topics. We're about ready to come out with our semester lineup. Please be on the lookout for that. Uh, hint, it will be on second Mondays and the topics will be really interesting. So I just want to briefly say why at the Institute we think environmental justice is so important. I know you'll hear much more about this from the panel today, but for me personally, I just cannot conceive of this concept of a sustainable future or a prosperous future where issues of equity and justice are not an essential part of the conversation. When we talk about sustainable, sustainable for whom? How do we maximize and make it possible for all people to live a, a resilient and flourishing future while at the same time protecting those essential natural resources that make life on Earth possible and pleasurable? So it's really my pleasure to welcome our moderator, Christina Lundgren. Christina is a former student of mine. Not that that alone makes her great. No, she was a student in one of my classes, so I know Christina is spectacular. She's a recent grad of the U, and she also is a former INE -er, uh, has been was a student employee here at INE. And she leads us in conversation today because she led a mini grant. Mini grants are one way in which we see terrific ideas in small ways to get them going. Uh, at the Institute, and we, she led a mini grant that studied the status of the environmental justice curriculum here at the university, asking questions like, what are we doing, what could we do more, and what is important uh, in growing that curriculum at the U. So Christina is going to lead us in a broad-ranging conversation about environmental justice at the University of Minnesota, and I hope elsewhere as well. And I will leave it to Christina to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Christina. Hello, is this projecting? Awesome. So this is my first time being a moderator. I'm super excited. I've had a lot of great advice from the panelists up here. Um, and we would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Dakota Oyate, the ancestral land of Ocheti Shokowin and sacred land of the Dakota people. This is unceded land of the Dakota people. We respect this land acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward for respectful partnerships with the indigenous people as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor the land together. And so this was an acknowledgement written by Francis Bentleyun, and part of what is asked is to share a personal story of how during the acknowledgement how the presenter relates to settler colonialism and how one benefits. And so my personal story is, on my dad's side, they came as farmers, and while yes, they worked hard, they had the opportunity and that choice. Whereas the people who were formerly here did not have the choice to be on that land because they were forcibly removed. On my mother's side, they came here as refugees, so they were a little more reluctant to engage in the system, but I still benefit from a lot of those systems that are in place today.
All right, and the panelists. Okay, so um, let me get the right sheet out. So first we have Sam Grant here. He is the Environmental Sustainability Program Director at HECUA, which is Higher Education Consortium, Consortium for Urban Affairs. Um, Sam lives to organize, teach, facilitate, and realize environmental justice for all on, honor, on our beautiful common home, Earth. And then we have Sai, who is a proud alumna of the University of Minnesota and is currently working full-time with hopes to work internationally to further climate action and environmental justice. And we have Dr. Michelle Garvey. She's a teaching specialist in gender, women, and sexuality studies, as well as sustainability studies. And her work pivots on co-developing projects with community partners and students that channel academic labor and research into environmental, food, and climate justice movements. We also have Danya, who, fun fact, has been a student of the three educators on this panel. <laughs> Mm-hmm, yeah. And so she's in her final year of undergrad at the U of M, and a co-founder, along with Nick Knighton over here in the corner, not corner, but side, um, for a student group called Voices for Environmental Justice, also known as VEG. And Danya advocates for education-based and environmental justice through both on-campus and off-campus community-based initiatives. And last but not least, Jessica Lopez-Lyman, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Chicano and Latina Studies. She is an interdisciplinary performance artist and Chicana feminist scholar interested in indigenous and people of color and how they create alternative spaces to heal and imagine new worlds. So we have a lot of really cool people up here. I'm super excited. Um, so the first question is, how did you come to this work? And how do you perceive environmental justice? And then educators, could you also share guiding principles for working with community partners and building reciprocal relationships? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so my name is Sai. I graduated from the U last year. Um, and the question was, how did I come to this work? So I actually took a class with um, Mary and Beth, who also work at IANI. And um, in that class, I was introduced to the, vo the principles of environmental justice for the first time in my life. And I kind of read that document, and it kind of was like a really like spark went off, and this is what I want to do. This is how I see my work going in the future. This is how I see my career leading to. Um, I felt that at the U, I was not seeing the um, curriculum and the classes that I wish I could have access to with related to environmental justice. I um, was taking other classes that were kind of touching on the topic, but never really named it. And I was not sure why there, was a, um, there wasn't a class that actually said environmental justice in the title. And that was before Michelle's class. Um, and I kind of wanted to work and see what I can do to make that happen at the U. So I work with um, the Minnesota Student Association um, to draft a document that um, shows student support for increasing environmental justice curriculum on the campus. Um, we were able to work with Dania and Nick. We were able to work with Michelle. Um, I was able to get a lot of um, feedback and support from um, all the people here at IONI, and we were able to pass that resolution as a way to say that we want, all students want more environmental justice curriculum on this campus, and we need to work harder to make that happen. Um, so that's how I came to working with environmental justice and um, furthering that on the campus. <clears throat> All right, good. Uh, so my name is Danya, um, and similar experiences to Sai. Um, I mean, if we really want to get into it, I would say this all started in like my childhood. But, um, you know, as early as I could remember feeling unsafe in a space. Um, but I think more recently, um, I started to think about the intersections of 
all these issues that I cared about in late high school. Um, I was really passionate about social justice, racial justice, um, you know, health and food and environmental issues and all of these things. I, I started to think about a lot more intricately. Um, and so by the end of my senior year in high school, I was like, all right, all of these things are really related and I want to work on something that can create a space for all of that, um, all of those ideas and all of those, th um, you know, frameworks to sort of come to life. Um, and so I guess that's sort of how I ended up in environmental science um, policy and management, the major here in CFANS, um, my freshman year. And I was really excited because I, I thought that I would come into a space where I would meet people and have professors who had really similar thoughts and ideas um, about how we view environment and how we view the challenges and you know that we're seeing in the 21st century right now. And um, that was not the case. Um, education was um, very dry. And um, note also that my freshman year was the um, fall 2016, um, was my first semester here. And um, I think everyone was sort of, you know, intense energy. And so because I wasn't really seeing that in my classes and in the spaces that I was in here in the institution, I thought, you know, um, one, I'm going to do, I'm going to work to advocate to have more of that on this campus. And two, because I currently don't have that in my education, I'm going to work to find those experiences outside of the campus um, because that's where the work is happening. And I want to be a part of that because I'm really excited and passionate about that. So um, both like the work happening here on campus and then the environmental justice in initiatives happening um, both here in the Twin Cities and statewide um, are issues that became really important to me. Um, so that's sort of how it came to it, um, and it really wasn't until I took Sam's HECUA course in fall of 2017 where I started to really formalize um, my language around environmental justice um, to the point now where I um, am really excited about um, the conversations going on about it right now. So. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Christina, for having me. Um, so I don't consider myself an environmental justice scholar. Other people consider me that, and that's why I get invited to places like this. But as a Chicana feminist scholar, um, the work that we do in Chicano Latino studies and other ethnic studies is that we constantly are thinking from an intersectional perspective how uh, race, class, gender, etc., always are influential in everything that we do. Um, and for me, especially the environment. So as an organizer, for example, um, oftentimes we'll do different actions or boards that I'm on, and we think about how folks of color and native folks are affected more than white people when it comes to issues of environmental uh, injustice. So for example, I was on the board of Tamales y Bicicletas, where Danya does a lot of her work now, um, a few years back, and we were organizing against gentrification, looking at the reef, roof depot site in East Phillips. That's also an environmental issue because 80% of young people in East Phillips have asthma, right? And these happen to be what the city deems an um, area of concentrated poverty, right? So these are highly uh, neighborhood concentrated of working class people, people of color, native folks. Um, another example is in my most recent book project I'm working on, I look at contemporary Latina artists, and as a Chicana feminist researcher, I believe I follow where the artists take me, where the research participants take me. And a lot of them are doing work right now with Native folks that are on the front lines, um, both the, you know, starting with the work with Sandpiper, then Standing Rock, and now Line 3. And so part of my ethics as a researcher means that I also go to these places. Um, which leads me to some of the principles I think about when I do my work. So I have four principles um, that I try to follow as an educator, as a teacher in the classroom, especially when we do um, the work that's more engaged with the community, and then as well as my research. And the first is to show up. I think a lot of times people just want to drop in, or they want to do it online, or they want to, you know, clicktivism is a thing, right? I, I share the Facebook post, um, but you really have to show up in person. The second is do the work that's not glamorous. This is not about your ego. Um, this is not about you taking the spotlight. You know, as somebody with a PhD, as a doctor, we often are seen as experts. 
um, and people ask for interviews, things like that, but I always make sure that it's the community members that are most impacted, that they're the ones that are speaking. My research is the one um, used to leverage their accountability, but I don't need to be the voice, and I definitely don't need to be the one on camera. Um, and part of the work of it not being glamorous is that you have to do things like fold chairs, take out the trash, you know, participate in those community spaces. The third principle I try to follow is leverage your resources. Um, this I mean both in terms of your identity politics. So if you're white and you're doing work around environmental justice issues and you have folks of color, put your body on the line. Or if you're in spaces where you have undocumented people um, and you're a citizen and you're doing some form of direct action, making sure that you're leveraging those kind of privileges. At the same time, leveraging your resources. So as a scholar, I try to give as much money um, that the university has to the community whether it's paying people for interviews, paying to archive, paying for their artwork, for photos, anything that I can somehow create an invoice for, always trying to give by money, trying to give space, making photocopies, don't tell the chair of my department, but we photocopy a lot of things for community. And then the last um, is circle back. So make sure you're, if you're, um, anytime we're doing interviews or working with folks, um, I know some of my students are going to be doing, they do internships. I always ask them at the end to write a formal thank you card, old school, send it in the mail, not an email, um, to make a phone call thanking people for their time. And then as a researcher, always sending the report. Um, if it's going to be published, sending it before it goes to anywhere, whether peer review um, or a book project, so that those community folks have an opportunity to look at it because oftentimes um, I hear from so many folks, artists, community organizers, et cetera, that researchers come in, they take their stories, and they never give the book back. They never give the article back. And for me, that's a really big injustice. Thanks, hi, uh, that was, that's a lot to follow. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so we were asked, how did we come to this work, and how do we see or envision environmental justice, and what principles do we bring to the classroom? Um, I came to this work through feminist environmentalisms. I got an internship a long time ago with the Women's Environmental Institute here in North Branch, Minnesota, and it was really my relationship with then Representative Karen Clark and then um, uh, Dr. Jackie Zita, who used to be in the Gender, Women, Sexuality Studies Department here, that I discovered um, environmental justice. Feminist environmentalisms and environmental justice, or what I call EJ, um, share a lot of the same values. They're two different kinds of movements, so I'm not collapsing them, but they do share this idea that social justice and ecological integrity need to be approached simultaneously. Um, and, uh, of course, both feminist enviros and EJ are highly intersectional, which Dr. Lyman just um, uh, touched on as well. Um, so specifically, in gender studies, we look at the ways in which sex and gender and sexuality minorities um, are often foremost affected by environmental racism or environmental colonialism. And um, oftentimes, because of that, not always just because of that, um, uh, women, for example, tend to be the, foremon the foremost leaders of different environmental food, water, and climate justice movements. Um, so we try to showcase those um, leadership um, positions as well. Um, I see environmental justice, and I've, I've had several of you in class, so this is gonna, I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, but um, I think of it as um, a, a movement from NIMBY to NOPE. And by that I mean um, that it is at its core a resistance movement. So NIMBY is an acronym that of course means not in my backyard. Um, so it's a movement that um, appreciates the ways in which both the benefits and um, uh, uh, you know, drawbacks or limitations of environmental resources are inequitably, inequitably distributed. Um, and so there's a resistance against that inequitable power distribution. Um, but it's also a world revisioning movement, and that's where we get this acronym of NOPE, not on planet Earth. Um, and so it, there's kind of this push and pull that's um, both, uh, it's, it's a movement of, of righteous anger and frustration uh, and justice, and it's also a movement of um, reconceiving what a future could and should look like when um, the planet isn't disposable and people aren't disposable. Um, 
as an educator, um, if I'm following this idea that EJ is about from NIMBY to NOPE, um, I really think it's my duty to get students connected, to get them there to where those resistance movements are. Um, so, uh, you know, we can, it, EJ is a robust scholarly field. So we look at those robust scholarly readings. We look at the sociological literature and the ge geographical literature and the historical literature, right? But not everything can be experienced in a classroom, in a book. It's also about getting people on the ground. Um, so for example, we do toxic tours um, with tamales bicicletas. Um, and interestingly, um, after I have uh, students engage in these tours and do write-ups, um, one of the um, same reflection comes up over and over again, and that's that they remember the smell. <laughs> Um, more than the sights, more than the sounds, more than connecting the on the ground stuff in their experiences to the to, to the text, students remember how badly the industry smells that we were forced to bike and walk through, and we were only just forced to bike through it, right? Um, and so I think that's important for a couple of reasons. First, um, it's that smell that's going to linger in their mind, maybe when a quote from a PhD will not. Um, and I think it's also important to connect students to those um, sensical experiences because um, then they come to appreciate that there are so many experts uh, and knowers off campus, on the ground, with or without these fancy letters behind their name that know um, the neighborhood. They know what the neighborhood needs. As academics, we tend to study away, right? We produce incredible um, research on air pollution, and I don't know how many times air pollution has been studied in North Minneapolis or the South Side Green Zone. We know it's polluted, right? Let's think about using time and resources and, and money into <clears throat> remediating, into reparations, right? And preventing that um, that kind of injustice in the first place. I also have <clears throat> another example. Um, I just returned from a week and a half long trip or so with the Augsburg River semester where um, those folks are paddling the Mississippi from the headwaters to the Gulf. And I got to kind of join in with a bunch of different scholars from Baton Rouge to Louisiana, which as you know is also called the Chemical Corridor, uh, Petrochemical Alley, or Cancer Alley. Um, so it's an 85 mile stretch of the river where there's only over 150 um, uh, chemical fac facilities, oil, uh, coal, nuclear, just about every kind of um, disgusting uh, industrial site you could imagine. Um, and um, one of the um, one of the many kind of sensory experiences that uh, was to be had on that trip, in addition to the sound violence, um, which was incredible, many of us didn't sleep all night because industry is going on all around us um, and it's very loud. Um, we also had a scholar who was dragging a microphone underneath so that she could hear the, the, the toxic violence of industry below water. And she made us listen to that for 10 minutes, just 10 minutes around the campfire. And it was just about unbearable to listen to how um, loud and grating it was. So those of you who are sensitive to ecology and um, um, hopefully that can resonate. Her, her name is Margarita Mendez, if you ever want to look her up. She's from Lisbon. Um, but we also camped out in the sand and um, where these um, uh, bits of plastic called nurdles washed ashore. Um, and so it didn't take much finding. These are uh, these nurdles, which I can pass around. Please don't take them because I would love to keep them. Um, there's a few shells in there from the river as well. Um, it's just one byproduct of um, the petrochemical industry. There's a lot of plastic facilities there. Um, I think that we as environmentalists are very good at appreciating and understanding the plastic, for example, as an ecological um, devastation. Um, but I think we also need to remember and this is something that environmental justice teaches us, is that every time we um, engage with plastic or are forced to engage with plastic because we don't have alternatives, we are also perpetuating white supremacy. Um, and by that I mean, 
in the chemical corridor, these industries um, exist on former slave plantations, right? They've bought, bought up former slave plantations. In some cases, you can see plantation mansions surrounded by Dow Chemical or Syngenta, right? And before they were slave plantations, of course, they, it was stolen land. So there's these layers and layers of toxicity, right? Both metaphorical and material toxicity happening. Um, every time we engage with plastic, we're also engaging in sexism because um, the chemicals that uh, are used to produce and recycle plastic, of course, affect um, sex, sexual uh, minorities and especially reproductive bodies uh, first and foremost, right, in terms of toxic breast milk and um, miscarriages and preterm births, low-weight births. Um, so those are the kinds of experiential, you know, ways that our scholarship touches down and can have really lasting kind of, um, hopefully, material um, effects. Then when we think of moving to NOPE, right, not in my backyard, I also try to engage students to make sure that um, they are actually contributing to the movement, to affecting change. Um, and so working with community partners, um, we have contributed farm and garden labor. We've contributed um, uh, digital maps to, tra to trace um, uh, epidemiology. Uh, the epidemiology of certain affected um, neighborhoods. Um, we've held teach-ins um, on the Green New Deal and other topics, um, and we've conducted scholarly research and then funneled them, in, them into EJ orgs that then use them for their policy platforms. So there's so many ways to touch base and to check in, um, and uh, I'd be happy to talk maybe more about strategizing or brainstorming some of those ideas toward the end. Um, you asked about a um, value uh, or a guiding principle, I would say, uh, power redistribution. It's all about redistributing power. Um, that's what I see as my role in this uh, institution. So first and foremost, I'm an earthling. And as far as I can tell, all of y'all are earthlings too. Our beautiful home is being disrespected by really bad human behavior. And the University of Minnesota and the curriculum here at the University of Minnesota is very much imbricated in all of that. And so I'm excited to be here because I think as the Institute on the Environment and my peers here among students and faculty reflect on how do we begin to heal our relations as earthlings together, I think this notion of environmental justice really sits at the root of that. So as a person born in a black body you know, on this planet, um, I developed asthma at a very young age because my family lived right across from a plant that was causing respiratory you know, disease. That's a normative condition for black people across this planet, so I'm not special. That's kind of what we get, um, you know, living in the blues of Babylon, otherwise known as America spelled with three Ks. Um, so that's deep environmental injustice. When you think about being born into a world designed by a pattern of structural violence. So at its core, my experience of the world we're living in is a world of structural violence. And so as I think about the journey of environmental justice, at its core, the journey is both a denunciation of what we've done to our earth and to each other, but it's also an affirmation that our past does not define us and that we have an obligation to be our higher self in relation to the earth and in relation to each other. And that kind of convivial norming makes the journey towards health and justice actually a joyful journey. And so a lot of you waste a lot of time shucking and jiving about how difficult it is to put your fucking white fragility down <laughs> and get with relationship and, you know, just rub your belly, wobble a little bit from side to side and recognize that you know, we're here and we're your relatives and uh, we got to stop waiting on each other to show up with a little bit of bravery and a little bit of humility joined together as a form of love. So giving love to the earth, giving love to each other, giving love to the future that we're dreaming, this is the process of what it means to be a living relative, um, giving birth, midwifing possibility through your day-to-day -day behavior. And so environmental justice is the ethos through which the practices of a healthy future emerge through all of us 
all of our personal lives, all of our relationships, all of our institutions. So that's the basic stuff I want to add to what my brilliant sisters have all, you know, put out, you know, in the circle about this work. So to speak about the practice in the curriculum, at HECUA I have the opportunity to work with students in an immersive way. So the students learn by doing. My very first year of teaching HECUA in 2015 was the year that Jamar Clark was killed by the cops. So my students got to go through the encampment and sort of experience that as an environmental justice issue. I got into teaching back in 1988 because the cops murdered a, uh, two, two black senior citizens in North Minneapolis. I had no intention of ever you know, being a professor or being in the academy. But after trying to understand why did that happen, I went and did a lot of research on domestic militarism and the historic relationship between police and black communities. And I did a workshop on this at the St. Paul Labor Center for you know, hundreds of, of labor union activists. And there was a professor who came up at to the end and said, uh, I want you to come teach at my university. And I only had a BA at the time. And she said, none of that matters. There's no application. You're hired. All you got to do is say yes, and I give you a key to a classroom. And I said, well, if you're going to make it that easy, why not? <laughs> Going into the classroom and not having a clue, except from watching my mother and father's examples about how to teach, I realized that my only hope was to do what I've always done, which was to teach in a circle. So if, as Nick and Donya can tell you, um, I was more excited to have them in my class than they were to have me you know, in the class because I got to learn from them from the very first day. And so part of the curriculum is to set conditions where learning happens in a circle and everybody's the teacher and everybody's the learner. So that was the dynamic um, pretty consistently. So the second year, I didn't have the opportunity to take the students off on, pretty, uh, on a major kind of sojourn. But we have this deep relationship with a farm in Osceola, Wisconsin called Lily Springs Farm. So as we think about the principles of healthy relationship, the farmers at that farm are part of my curriculum. Um, they're part of my faculty. I pay them for their role. And then the students are contributing a labor you know, contribution to all of the work that's happening at that farm. So they're getting a yield out of the students' contribution. And my students are getting something that I think they could all report is truly transformative. Because they're learning from the ground up how to do some of the most amazing regenerative agriculture that's happening anywhere you know, on the planet right now. It's happening through my students' contribution from 2015 to the present at this farm in Wisconsin. And anybody who's in this circle, you're welcome to come with us on one of our trips. We're going tomorrow, in case you want to come. It's going to be cold, 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 but we're still going to go. <laughs> and my students beg, can we just stay inside tomorrow? And the farmer's like, nope, we've got to be outside, so you've got to be outside. Um, so another principle um, in terms of doing this work is to realize that there's this principle of uh, putting the last first. So in environmental justice work, you're centering the people who've been socioecologically marginalized. And for you to get out of your own way with your privilege is not something you know how to do until you begin to get into relationship and you learn through experience more and more over time how to do that. It is not easy. I think Jessica used the word sticky in terms of explaining this work. It is sticky. It's not easy. Um, but the more you do it, the easier it gets, the more grace you find in this work. And so I think, number one, just do it. Number two, be humble as you do it. And uh, lead with questions, not with uh, imposing answers. And I think that it's really easy in the academy to impose what you learned in the classroom as though it matches reality, and it often doesn't. So I think part of the challenge is to turn around the direction where the classroom is the community. And what's happening in the college you know, setting is that the professor is holding a circle in which all of the students are leading perspective from self to group about what, do I, what did I notice that's relevant for me? What did you notice that's relevant for you? And what's the common pattern that we see? And how do we serve that common pattern in a more and more nourishing way as we go to the next stage of relationship with this community? So I want to end with this word of transformation. If you dare to come into a community, come into the community not because you want to help. Please, if you want to come help us, stay home. Because help is a form of oppression. If you recognize that your liberation is fundamentally, inextricably bound with ours, then we're already relatives. And then, we, then the good work can begin. You're going to learn through the struggle with us 
how to do that work more and more effectively. We're going to learn how to do that more and more effectively. This isn't easy, but I do want to say that it's actually kind of fun and it is actually kind of joyful to do something where you feel like you put your spirit, you put all of your knowledge, you put everything you think makes sense at risk, and then something greater emerges because everybody in the circle is doing that. So that's the value of doing true environmental justice work. It's learning to lead by this vibration of being an earthling with other earthlings, taking care of the earth, taking care of each other, taking care of the future. Cool, thanks everyone for sharing. We're gonna transition um, shortly into Q&A from the audience. So start thinking of questions you wanna ask and we're passing around, Jan is passing around note cards for you to write your questions on. And we'll have you answer, we'll have panelists address the questions in clusters so they can sort of pick th similar themes to pull from. Um, but really quick as we, there's two things I wanna do. Um, Sam already began a great transition towards it, but something that gives you hope. And this idea, because a lot of this work can be heavy and it's hard to make time for ourselves. And so in 60 seconds or less, if you guys want to share something that gives you hope. Sitting in the back on the right side of the room is Jamez Staples, the example of a environmental, urban environmentalist who is doing the hard work every day of his life is one thing that gives me hope. Uh, sitting in the third row is uh, Nick Knighton, and sitting on the stage with me is Danya Marin Gavilan. Um, it gives me hope to see people who are stepping forward and doing this work. So Ella Baker recognized that young people engaged in movement while students is the key to evolutionary change accelerating. And so I have always taught from a student-centered vantage point of you know, engaging with students in movement building. And so I live um, where hope is unfolding every second of my life because I'm always working with students who live with a more open kind of consciousness. What gives me hope, we have a concept, la cultura cura, meaning our um, culture cures. And for me, this is the principle that I live by in terms of how I see the world. Um, I just interviewed Natani Means and Maria Issa the other day, two hip hop artists um, that did a Balance the Nations tour. And they talked about how our ceremonies have survived for thousands of years despite colonialism. And they might have transformed as hip hop artists um, they see that as a form of ceremony, but thinking about how we have traditional ways, we have our ways of knowing, um, and despite all of these forms of oppression, we've still maintained them, transformed them, and used them to heal. I will go since I made that noise. Um, I, I think more and more um, about movement building and um, you know a lot of the work that's happening right now on the ground uh, Twin Cities community and I think of this concept that's you know we have to make the movement um, really um, pleasurable or exciting we have to make it like very tempting so that people can say you know um, this work that's really crucial to our liberation as Sam was saying um, doesn't have to be just suffering it doesn't have to be just um, you know, pain and, and recognizing all of this, it, it can also be really healing. It could also be really joyful and exciting. And you can be in community and you can be with people that you um, are growing in relationship with. And I have found that in the last few years as I've been trying to be more um, um, in these types of spaces that it really has um, uh, maybe not necessarily given me hope, but given me a lot of uh, gratitude. Um, and it's made me... Um, really compelled to keep doing this kind of work when I can be like, okay, yes, this is really exhausting on me mentally, um, but at least I get to be here and sit in all of that with people that I, that I trust and people that um, have these similar visions. And to me, that's really um, inspiring. That's really compelling. Um, I was thinking about this question earlier today, um, and I, I met up with someone who was in the Who's Diversity movement um, in the last few years. Um, this past, like, uh, back in spring, and we were talking, and he was like, um, how do you, like, deal with all of this at the university? <laughs> and I was like, I honestly, I think it's the people. It's the people that I've been so fortunate to come across and the opportunities that I've so been so fortunate to come across. Um, that's the only reason I've been able to graduate in four years. <laughs> so I think it's, I think it's the people. I think it's the, the um, 
act of uh, being in this joyful healing space with people in the movement that's um, really compelling. For me, uh, like Sam, it's students. Um, I honestly don't know what I would do if I had to wake up every morning to the news headlines and not get to visit with the students the rest of the day. Um, I've been teaching here for about a decade, and in those early days, I, I, tell this pe I tell people this all the time, I used to have and, um, uh, these days, the students come prepared. They come knowing, um, and they come ready. They come ready to work. Um, they are hungry for opportunities to get the job done and for opportunities to plug in. Um, and so increasingly, I see my role as an educator is to be that facilitator and show them from radical to reformist ways to plug in, that they don't need a degree behind their name in order to actually affect real change, and that together in a time span of only three months, we can figure out something um, with, uh, we can figure out a collaborative project with a community partner um, to make measurable change. Um, and to see students make that transformation um, in uh, that semester space um, where they're feeling empowered, where they have connections and networking established that can carry them um, beyond their time here at the U is incredibly powerful. Um, and uh, for that, I'm also very grateful. There's quite a few of those change makers in this classroom that I've had the privilege of working with, and I was, my mom is also here, and I, I introduce them as my accomplices and my friends. They're not my students. Like, we are in this movement together, um, and we stay in touch. You must stay in touch <laughs> after graduation because we're gonna keep working on this, right? I think for me, I'm just going to echo what everyone said. I have very supportive peers and mentors. I remember applying to graduate school, and I was not sure if I could do it. And I, I, spoke, I went up to Michelle's office hours and spoke to her, and she showed so much confidence in me. Um, I spoke to Sam, too. Um, and I think it's just the support that other people show in me gives me the confidence that I can do this work. Um, I, yesterday I was FaceTiming my parents and my dad actually asked me, are you happy? And I took 30 seconds, I'm like, am I? For the most part, yes. So I'm very, very fortunate and I'm grateful that I have supportive, really, really supportive parents, really supportive mentors, really supportive peers. Um, and they show the confidence in me to do this work. Um, I don't do it right now, like in my daily life, but I sh see this every day that I have so much support to do this work and I want to continue to do it and it gives me hope to do it that I have so much support in my life to keep doing this and that's a lot of people don't have that and I'm very grateful and that that's some kind of privilege to have that much support from your parents who actually ask you are you happy so um, um, I'm really grateful for that and that gives me hope my parents yes Do we have questions assembled? If not, we can do some more conversation. We can start to assemble them. Um, I know Sai and Zanya, could you speak a little bit more about the process of finding environmental, you both touched on it a little bit, but in finding environmental justice education within and navigating that within the university system? Um, I can start. Um, so my major, or I graduated with biology. I don't have any or actually my degree doesn't give me any environmental education of any sort. I am an international student. I'm originally from India, so I immigrated 2015. Yes, that's four years ago. Um, and environmental education, environmental justice, sustainability, any of those words were not something I was looking for. And I came in and I did an internship with Eureka Recycling in um, St. Paul. And that kind of put this seed in my mind, like, ooh, this seems interesting, this seems fun. And then I did a, another internship in India with a startup that works with um, tribal communities and upcycling plastic. And then I said, this is what I want to do. And then I started working at Ayani. And it just kind of, it was this cycle, it was this, what do you call it, movement in my own head where things just kept happening for me. I did not have any liberal, liberal ed credits, and I 
I'm very lucky that I didn't, because I ended up taking classes in um, learning about the Cold War, learning about historically about colonialism. I come from India, so I was taught from fourth grade what colonialism is. I learned about the British freedom movement like twice, the whole movement twice. So I was very ingrained in it, and I found that absent here. Um, in education and the way people are taught about um, injustice. The way I was taught about injustice, colonialism, capitalism, globalism, everything is so much different than what an American is taught. And I saw that glaring difference in my head and I said, well, climate change and climate justice is a global movement. It's not something that um, one country, the leader of the free world can solve. Um, and is so connected, so um, intersectional. I don't like to use that word a lot because people have, anyway. Um, uh, and I saw that glaring like gap and I tried to look out for opportunities. I took a class in environment and development in the third world and um, the professor was great and he was very passionate in the way he taught. So I think for me, the way I navigated the system was genuinely seeking out opportunities. These opportunities weren't presented to me. Um, I had to actively seek out for them and it was very hard to look for them. And I was very fortunate for working with, um, working at IONI and working with, um, working with people who knew of such opportunities. For example, somebody who's coming in, a first year student will not know all of this. Uh, they will not know how to find that information. And I was fortunate enough that I was given the opportunity to find that information. And, um, and I saw that glaring gap, and I saw the way that different people are taught different things from different parts of the world. And I wanted to make sure that the U, we, the U they claim that we're a global university, giving a global education, and that is not true. Because um, there is nothing global about how we teach things here, or we, not we, they teach. I don't know how to say that. Um, I'm not a student here anymore. Um, but I saw that glaring gap and I wanted to make sure that when I leave, or at least by the time I leave, I did something that made a difference. And that's why I did the whole, all the work I did with MSA. Um, and just making sure that I left something of my work and something of what I wanted to do when I came in. I came in with no idea, no family, no friends, nothing. And I left some kind of mark on what I did at the U. And I think that's how I ended up navigating the space of finding that glaring gap. And it still exists, and I see it every day. And hopefully in my future work, I can close it or try to close it internationally as well. Um, hello, hello. Um, so I think from late high school, I realized I didn't want like a traditional college experience. Um, that being said, I still ended up at the university, um, and it was funny because my whole life I was like, I'm never going to go to the U, I'm going to leave, I hate the U, I'm not going <laughs> to, and then I ended up here. Um, but it was, I, I am really grateful that I did because there's been a lot of like serendipitous moments that I sometimes think about and I'm just like, oh my gosh, if I had never chosen to come here, I never would have met this person, have done this thing, been connected, um, and ultimately um, I feel really rooted to Minneapolis and to um, Minnesota. Um, but um, I went in um, in environmental science policy and management, um, specifically under like an education and communication track, I believe. Um, and I think my intention was I wanted to um, focus on, on environmental issues and how we can make um, the knowledge surrounding that accessible, especially to communities that maybe don't have that information um, so um, easily or maybe it isn't as digestible. Um, and then I came to really become interested in food and agriculture and food systems um, and specifically food and um, and community. Um, and I ended up realizing that ESPM, um, that major, was not for me, or that I wanted to diversify a bit, um, and so I've, I've um, finally been wrapping up my um, individualized degree, so it's in two parts, one being environmental justice, um, which a lot of the credits come from Sam's class, comes from the class I'm in with Jessica right now, Theory in Action about community organizing, um, and then Michelle's class, actually, <laughs> environmental justice, um, and then another um, Chica Next course um, that was about migrant farm workers. 
Um, and then the other part of my degree is landscape design and planning. And I think my idea with all of this was, um, you know, I'm really interested in the ways that um, agriculture, specifically alternative ways of agriculture, can be utilized to, one, um, address climate change, two, um, provide, or not provide, but um, sort of hold space and power for vulnerable, vulnerable communities um, to gain autonomy. And a lot of that, um, I think, relates to sovereignty. Um, so anyways, I was, I was thinking about all these things and how I wanted to wrap up my education in that way, um, while simultaneously being like, all right, um, I'm really being nitpicky about the classes I'm choosing and the professors I'm going to. That was a really important part for me. Um, but it was also about um, addressing these issues on campus and then also off campus. So with Voices for Environmental Justice, uh, as a student group um, that um, we co-started, um, we have been doing um, a lot of organizing to get students connected to off-campus um, organizations and initiatives, um, doing work around uh, the Line 3 pipeline. Um, we've done in the, the, you know, this past year, um, advocating for um, the work happening in the Upper Harbor Terminal on the north side, um, getting involved in the initiatives that we could tap into and um, ultimately pool resources into. Um, because I knew, you know, um, I was not going to find everything I needed to find at the university. So while I'm here, I might as well use the privilege of being here to what Jessica was saying, pull all these resources back into community. Um, so one of the things we did, for example, was hold, we held like an environmental justice symposium last fall where we invited a panel of EJ activists, um, which Sam was on, um, Jose Luis, who's at the organization Tamales de Bicicletas, um, and then some folks from Black Visions Collective, um, and then we also had um, some folks from Indigenous Roots um, here in St. Paul, and then we had, you know, uh, um, Tom Goldtooth, who is a prominent um, Indigenous um, activist from the Envi um, Indigenous Environmental Network, and we paid a bunch of, um, this, we paid the speakers, we paid local artists, we paid um, local food vendors, um, and so it was this, idea that like if I'm here I, I want to make it count and I want to be able to pull those resources back and so um, all of that work has made my um, time here at the university much more fulfilling if I haven't if I hadn't been doing um, this work in the last few years and I've just been like being a student studying I don't think it would have been as fulfilling um, so I guess in terms of navigating my education here it's been both like getting what I want out of my education and having more autonomy um, over um, my courses and then also to um, relating it back to the issues I care about um, is how I've made my time here worthwhile. Thank you. So now we're going to start to integrate some audience questions. They're in clusters and Beth is over here helping us. Ooh, thank you. I have some more. Organize. And so if, um, just because of time, if only a few folks want to answer each of the clustered questions, that'd be fantastic. So let's see, this first one is, how can the University of Minnesota be in right relationships with local and global environmental justice? Or like, what can we do? And then in like corresponding with that, um, how do we shift power at the University of Minnesota? And how uh, professionals can help? Yeah. Legal, Legal yes, thank you. Legal professionals can help. I'll say one quick thing. Um, in terms of research, I think that we, and in R1, are under this publish or perish kind of rat race. But when you're really doing deep community work, it takes a long time. And so I think being able to leverage, like I spoke earlier, uh, resources, but as well as uh, publications and um, other forms of research is really important. And so I think as a scholar, I try to always remind myself and in, in collaboration with other folks here who have a similar mindset that even though the issues are urgent, um, to build deep relationship takes a lot of time. And it's the work of, you know, I've babysat research participants' kids and made people dinners and all of these things, um, which I think when you become a faculty member, some people think, oh, I'm above that, I'm beyond that, and that's not the work, right? It's really deep, deep relationship work. Um, and then the second thing I would say is always trying to figure out as a scholar and a writer, how do you 
create alternative forms of publication that can get the work out quickly, knowing that your other projects um, for scholarship will take much longer, but using different mediums, whether it's podcasts or um, you know, newspapers, things like that, because as scholars, that's something that we really can provide, and that's something that organizers don't always have the time to do, or necessarily the resources and methodologies to complete, and I think that that's one of the ways that we can definitely contribute to the conversation in terms of changing the rhetoric, changing the discourse, and providing the evidence that for the communities I work with, they live on a daily basis and they already know that it smells terrible, right? This is our everyday life. Like Sam, I've had chronic asthma my whole life, which is part of what you live with, um, but leveraging our research knowledge to be able to support people's experiential knowledge. Thank you. Just to add to, to what she said, you think about the history of the University of Minnesota as a land-grant institution. What is the meaning of that at that particular moment when you became a land-grant institution? That was also the time of the Homestead Act, which was a time of giving a whole bunch of land to white people that wasn't theirs to be given to. Um, and so the whole history of the University of Minnesota as a land-grant institution is based on a whole lot of faulty assumptions about what it means to produce knowledge. So how do we dismantle the castle of imperial knowledge and midwife a small humble hut of participatory collaborative knowledge production? Um, so as I think about uh, Linda Tuhiwai Smith's work on research in indigenous people decolonizing methodologies, I think that's an important book for everybody to check out. And I think about Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And I think about Orlando Falls Borda, Action and Knowledge. Um, I teach from a vantage point of critical participatory action research, which means as a teacher, I am not the one with knowledge. That as a teacher, what I'm doing is connecting people to a universe of relationship, and the knowledge is in the circle. And the obligation I have is to set conditions for everybody to show up at the highest level they're capable of and foster con mutual learning. And so I think that the academy needs to get into right relationship, and I think it's really important to think about what that means. To get into right relationship means that faculty in the academy will go to communities that are facing environmental justice burdens and say, I want my curriculum to support this community's journey in answering your most critical questions. And I know that this is like an unfair thing for me to come and say, because I've got all this privilege and I get to have a syllabus and I get paid. Um, so I'm going to do what she's doing and I'm going to pay people from the community as my community faculty. So you'll get a stipend to come in and teach in my class. Um, your name will go on the syllabus as a co-producer of the knowledge in the syllabus. And whatever healing you need to do around your educational journey, I'm now obligated to support you in that. So if you want one of these fancy degrees and have these letters behind your name, I'm obligated to help you get that. If you want your street knowledge to be honored and you want me to help you put your resume together, and whether it's to help you get a job or help you create your own business venture, I'm committed to doing that as well, and then getting students to support you in that work. So right relationship is about practicing solidarity. And solidarity is not based on being an ally which I think is like, being an, it's like, it's like being a liberal who's helping when it's convenient to help. But being an accomplice is somebody who says, um, I can't sleep at night because you can't eat. So I have to get right with you right now because the hurt of one is the hurt of all, the honor of one is the honor of all, and I'm living with awareness of what's happening to people in my kinosphere. And if structural violence is happening out there, I am going to take responsibility to hospice that structural violence in partnership with you with all I've got. And if you and I aren't enough, I'm going to work with you until we get more people in the circle with us. So right relationship is a radical shift in the way that a university practices being a university. That's not an easy thing to ask of the University of Minnesota, but it's a necessary ask. And so I think it's an obligation for everybody in this room to think about what's your role in helping this university be on the journey of deep, right relationship? What's your piece of the answer to that? I think that's a dialogue that we ought to be having that we don't have time for today, but it's a dialogue to definitely continue because that's what we have to figure out, and we can't figure it out without each other. Thank you. And then we can still continue to address those questions. There are some new ones I got that tie in as well. Um, so how do you implement, so we've been talking about that a little, or how do you scale up? How do you unsettle or shift power? So Sam was sharing a little bit about that. 
And then where can you learn? Where can we all learn to get involved? Hmm. I had answers to the other question. Um, but <laughs> but let, me, let me, so the scaling up, scaling up, I have to think about that. Think about that some more. Um, what was the last part of the question, though? How to get involved. How to get involved. Ah, yes. Um, so uh, this, I think, plays really nicely into what both Sai and Dania were saying about um, the lack of support and the lack of environmental and critical climate training that they have received at the U. For the past couple of years, all of these folks have been working to figure out um, how we could create uh, some kind of environmental and climate justice hub um, of community engagement and scholarship here at the U. And it's been really tough because in order to do EJ um, right, as we have defined it, it needs to be interdisciplinary and that's really antithetical to how the U runs. And in order to do it right, it also has to be thoroughly engaged um, and, it, and it has to really um, support knowers off campus and compensate knowers off campus. And all of that is really difficult to do in this juggernaut nation state that is the Uni University of Minnesota. Um, so I would say one way to think about um, uh, facilitating relationships between scholars and students, administrators, community organizers, um, uh, folks who are working in private um, uh, organizations to promote eco-justice sustainability works um, would be to have, to let university people, let us have this environmental and climate justice major discipline, whatever it is that, that we can call it. Um, because fundamental to the kind of training we hope to provide is a way for every single researcher on this campus to plug in and for community members and activists and organizers to be able to look at our site or go to our de department, go to our point people and say, we need this study done. We need this action done. We need so many hours of student labor completed. You know, who are the trustworthy folks that we've been working with? Who has the expertise at the U? And we could have, we could build that hub um, right here to plug people in. So asking that question, I think, points toward a really important gap that we're trying very hard to address. Um, and it's a gap that our students uh, consistently point out and that MSA um, unanimously pointed out uh, last, last spring as well. Um, November 22nd. I'll say it again. November 22nd. Uh, we're having a symposium. Christy, remind me of the name. Pregnancy brain is so real. Okay, and it's really long name too. In, in I'll say it in the mic for the people online. Indigenous women on the front lines for climate change. I've had the privilege of working with scientists on this campus, um, as well as group Science for the People, Women for Political Change. And so November 22nd at 1.30, we're gonna kick it off with uh, two keynotes by Native folks who are doing this work, working with Line 3. We'll have um, a breakout session, some information and educational components, as well as uh, follow up with Northridge, Northfield, see how prepared I am, Northfield line three. Um, we'll do a closing and then we'll think about next steps. So November 22nd, we would love for you to be there. It's gonna be at Nicholson on the East Bank and there's a Facebook page in, under Chicano Latino Studies Department. I wanted to add one last thing on that question. Um, there's uh, people, um, whenever you sort of are in conversation about these um, topics or these issues, um, I think a lot of people's immediate response is like, how can I get involved? Who can I talk to? What can I do? Um, and that's like really, um, a na that's a very natural response and that's a very, um, um, sometimes urgency is needed. Um, but I think also, um, I go to this church and something we always start out with um, when we begin the service is, um, if you have a question about something, talk to someone who you trust and have a relationship with and um, talk to someone who shares similar identities as you and experiences as you. Um, you know, like if you're able body, don't go talking to someone who has a disability about their um, questions or oppression or whatever, you know, like talk to people that you have a relationship with um, and that you trust. Um, because a lot of this work is also inner. It's not just like the 
movement building, um, you know, community stuff, it is also um, how you're transforming yourself. Um, and so I, I guess that's one thing that I would add is um, think about um, who you can talk to that you already have a relationship with, about the questions or um, ways or uh, to get involved um, before you go talking to someone that you maybe don't have um, a relationship with, and especially someone you don't really share, um, you know, similar identities with. Just something to add as quickly as I can. Vandana Shiva put together this framework of eco-apartheid. And I think it's an important framework to understand around this question. So divide, division from nature, division from each other, and division from the spirit divine within. So when you create uh, a myth of separation from nature and a pattern of domination and control, you inevitably become a divided being and incapable of fostering healthy connection. So this question of how can I begin comes from this very tra traumatized, grief-stricken place of relationships are broken here. Relationships are broken here. I don't know how to begin to relate. And so if that's true for you, I think it's really important to honor and do the inner work, as Danya said, of doing grief work and crying about it, letting your holy water flow, and recognize that within your own consciousness, within your own spirit, is the capacity to take that first step. As long as you refuse to take that first step on your own feet with your own heart, it's going to be difficult for you to relate in a mutually generative way. You have to step forward. People can't take you there and plant you there and expect anything positive to come until you're doing the inner work. You have to come to relationship with relationship as the goal. Come to relationship with relationship as the goal. Then the rest can begin. Thank you. Um, so I think we might have time for one more question. It is, what do you do when your partner organization is not aligned with your beliefs or has different beliefs? And I think thinking vice versa, thinking in terms of how a community partner would also answer that question. It's related to the last question. Um, misalignment happens when we begin with imposition, not with dialogue. So if you begin with dialogue, you set conditions for mutuality from the very beginning. So the basis of any healthy relationship is what do you need from this relationship? What do I need from this relationship? How do we co-construct healthy conditions for this to be an enduring bond? Um, if you don't do that work, then the, things are going to go awry. And I think it's pretty normal when you come from a privileged institution to not take those baby steps. And anytime you fail to take those baby steps of healthy relationship, you're always going to pay consequences. But because you're privileged, the consequences don't hurt you as much as the people who took the risk of choosing to be in relationship with you. They lose extremely every time you fail to know how to come into healthy relationship. So how do you learn how to come into healthy relationship without requiring communities to continue to be your teacher and guide? You've got to do the inner work. As a person, you've got to do the inner work as an academic department. You've got to do the inner work as an institution. Um, community engagement is very sexy right now at the U. I'm also a community engagement scholar, and I didn't know that either about myself. Um, <laughs> it's just the work we do in ethnic studies and Chicano Latino studies. We've always done community engagement because we are accountable to community. That is in the inception of our discipline. But one of the things that I see a lot happen is that people want to create a new community engagement um, class because it's going to be so exciting and cutting edge. They need a syllabus, so they need to find a partner right away in the community. Or they want to do YPAR, like community partnerships right away, and now they're on a deadline. Or the worst, they're uh, on a grant cycle, and the grant says you have to have a final product in 90 you know, days or six months or one year, whatever it is. And I say throw all of that away, right? I mean, those are institutions of power that are telling you how to do the time line and quite frankly if you want to do a community engagement class and you don't have a deep relationship with people then you're not ready to do an engagement class and so maybe you plan okay this is something I want to do but I'll do it in the next few years so for example I'm really interested in working with Casa Esperanza right now to expand the theory and action course but I don't have deep relationship so my goal as an educator is I'm taking this year to build deep relationship to ask my network to do one-to-ones who knows these folks how can we get involved because they want our department to partner with them but we don't have that relationship right now 
but the relationships that I do have, then we can jump and get started and like Sam was saying, right, build based on whatever the partnership, um, whatever the organization needs, not what I see or what I need. Cool, so we have five minutes left. And is there anything that any of you haven't shared that you think would be important to say right now? Oh, do I? So just for, I mean, this is Christina's first time stepping forward to facilitate and moderate. So this isn't on her. But just for all of us to reflect on how we set up space. So just notice that there's this separation like a river between us. And we have chairs that are a little bit higher up. And I just have to acknowledge that as a person who is speaking to you, I feel a little bit disassociated because I'm at a slightly different level. And so that's messing with my capacity to speak from my deepest embodied place. And so I just think as we set up space, it's important to have the space reflect the uh, ethos that we want to generate in the conversation. So that's just thinking architecturally. I think it's a really important variable. Hi there. Um, thank you. Thank you all for the panel. Um, I'm, I was here for the introductions, but I'm sorry, you and the green, the fourth one over. You made a very um, interesting comment about um, making sure that, you know, kind of like bringing this to a different space outside of the university and bringing it to the community where there's actually a true engagement. And Sam made the same, co same comment. Um, I think it's important that we find a way to actually bring this conversation in a, in a very intentional way around and across uh, across the various departments of the university because all of us are trying to achieve the same thing but it's just that we're, there's no throughput of any of it so you know when we're looking at this we're saying i want to do this and the other person saying i want to do this they're all the same when we really get to the nitty-gritty of it and i think it's important <clears throat> that the university actually be intentional about actually creating that space in community and not just in one community but throughout various communities to actually help that happen. So I appreciate you all's comments and I really appreciate the fact that this, this was being held here. Thank you. Well, first of all, I just wanna thank all the panelists. I think this was a really incredible, informative and enlightening discussion. And next time maybe we'll be closer together in a circle. Um, but I would just like to have part two, which you suggested, Sam, about this realignment conversation and what that could look like um, for faculty, staff, students, and communities. So let me know what I can do. I would love to participate and assist you on that. Okay, got it. I'm signed up. Okay, thank you so much. And off campus. Yes. Mm -hmm. And a shout out to people and the EJ community who actually organized um, the event over at Euroke the other on Monday because they did it out in community. Could you raise your hands because I see a lot of you here today. Yeah, so they did it out in community and it was a fabulous um, workshop, so thank you guys. That is gratitude to all of you for speaking um, and sharing your effort and labor here. Um, as a student that is about to graduate, um, it's an interesting pattern that the university is like super great at holding panels like these and having these awesome conversations. Um, and after four years, sometimes it gets kind of exhausting to be like, oh man, that's another good conversation. I wonder when something's actually going to happen about it. <laughs> and so I would love, love, love for all of my faculty homies in the room right now who will have that power to do something about it to be like, oh, we had a good panel. Okay, now when are we going to have the ma minor? When are we gonna have the major? When are these things gonna be expanded upon? So I'm, I just hope um, that the theory and the words that we've all uh, been blessed to intake from these amazing people um, gets translated into practice and into structural change. 
And vice versa, I think it's really important, you know, in the ethnic studies department, we're constantly struggling and we do this work all the time. So you want to know how you can support us? Take our classes, all right? Mm -hmm. We need to, we're under pressure constantly to double our majors and be career focused and it's really hard to translate. I hope, you know, I think what Donnie is experiencing in my class on a flyer of why you should take my class. But if you want to be politically on the edge and doing work in this environmental justice, take ethnic studies classes. And just as a plug for Jamez, who spoke a, a little bit earlier, he took the risk of hosting a community space where the kind of off-campus immersive learning could actually happen. So for the faculty in the room, if you're looking for an off-campus learning laboratory where you can bring your students out and be in the community, pay rent to this brother and go and do your class there at his spot in North Minneapolis. Is that, can oh, I, oh, can I add a final? Oh, yeah. Um, I just want to follow up what Nick said. I did a lot of work last year with um, working with faculty and university administration, trying to um, advocate for increasing curriculum and to all the faculty and any person who works for the university. It's really, really hard for students to get their voices heard. This institution is primarily for students, but our voices are hardly ever heard. Um, we have to knock on doors 10 times to just get a meeting in. Um, I spoke with very high-ranking officials and got very depressing answers. Um, and, um, uh, and it's really disheartening to know that this institution that is primarily to impart education doesn't even hear our voices. Um, so if there are any faculty members or university officials here, if students are sending you emails asking you to support their work, respond, reply to those emails, meet with them, hear what they're talking about, because we really are just, we're not, I didn't, I got, fortunately, I got a stipend to do this work, um, but my, mm -hmm. my, but my peers, like Megan's here, she worked with me, she didn't get paid to do the work she did. Um, so, and, but she was doing the work, she was writing 10 emails a day to faculty members, university officials asking for support. Um, and that's really important that if a student sends you an email, just respond, please, and meet with us. We really wanna talk about our work, and we really want support from you. Um, and that's, it's really disheartening when I took a year just to pass one resolution. It took a year's worth of work for me, aside from school, aside from my two jobs, aside from applying to grad school. And I still wanted to do it, and I still did it. And I had a lot of support, but um, there was a lot of not support too. So just honestly, just respond to our emails. We would really appreciate that. <laughs> I just, I wanna add to what uh, you just heard from Cy, this is Beth Mercer-Taylor, I work in sustainability education, that it was the students who identified to faculty working here on the um, redesign of liberal education that the plans would have possibly left the university with no required class in environment and sustainability. And it was actually the work of student government and Voices for Environmental Justice that uncovered that, so. I think I can't emphasize enough what Sai just said being important. So yes, we should pay students and pay community for their labor, but also they have critically important insights that are missed, um, as we just saw. I think that might that ship might be getting righted right now, and that like bad outcome won't happen. But plan D. <laughs> right, this is actually yeah. If you're in the weeds of this, this is um, Plan D instead of Plans A, B, and C. Yeah. Um, Plan A also has no diversity requirements, so yes. just think about that. Yep. Okay, well thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I hope everyone has a safe drive home. I'm not sure I'm supposed to say at the end of a panel. <laughs> well yeah, thanks for coming. Okay. Oh, thanks.